I'd like to start by countering the premise we keep hearing at law teaching conferences these days, that we're all bad teachers and nothing's wrong with law schools. <laughs> Instead, I'd like to say that perhaps we're not entirely that bad. Perhaps we even do okay in teaching our law students about the law. After all, there are many brilliant legal minds out there, high-functioning, smart, capable practitioners living amongst us, and they all had to start somewhere. <laughs> but even if we do okay, what if we can do much better? There's always room for improvement. And, and if there's a better way of doing things, then perhaps our students are worth it for getting to where law teaching could be. In integrating skills with doctrinal teaching, one better way is towards an invisible blend of both. We tend to think that things that are conceptual are more important. I don't want my students to make that value judgment between skills and doctrine. Instead, that blend should be seamless so that we don't know, or they don't know, they don't know that they're picking up skills while they're learning the law. This leads to a faster competency with legal reasoning. And to do this, I have three steps. First, I look to when and where the nature of the doctrine tends to display itself within a particular skill set. I call this mimesis. It's where the, the law tends to avail itself particularly in showing us a certain skill in legal reasoning. Then I check to see how relevant it is for my students. Because adult learning theory tells me that the more they find something that's relevant to them, the better attention they'll pay to it. And lastly, I look for a point in execution, a, a place where they can discover this relevant mimesis through their own curiosities. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Yes, it's strawberries, but it's also more than that. It's also contracts. I teach first year contracts, and in developing the lesson in contractual offers, I noticed two things. That one, learning contracts for many of my students means breaking down their preconceived notions that contracts must involve uh, high level economics, accountants with foreign accents, and pages of boilerplate stuck onto group backing paper instead of simply a set of promises that the law will enforce. And two, more specifically, that the doctrine surrounding contractual offers, uh, what is if what we need a manifestation of willingness to enter into a bargain is, uh, in, is precise up to a certain point. But the determination of what actually constitutes an offer, indeed what is a manifestation of willingness, is fact sensitive and intuitive only once you've learned the rule. It's like what Justice Stewart said about obscenity, I know it when I see it. Um, the, if, if I know how to marshal the facts under a rule, then I know what an offer looks like when I see one. The hard part is knowing how to marshal and spin those facts. Now, I could have taught offers Socratically and then move on to something else. But one, I had seen where the mimesis was, that overlap between skills and the, the law put together. This lesson was going to be as much about offers as it was going to be about marshaling facts. And two, this was relevant for my students because knowing how to marshal facts it will come up in law school exams and classes, but also in all sorts of boring situations. And lastly, three, we're on to the discovery. I wanted a context that would play off their preconceived notions of contracts and also allow me to emphasize fact sensitivity. No foreign accents here. So in comes these strawberries. I wanted them to see offers instead of read about them in text. Facts are something that are tangible, visceral, and even tactile. And this wasn't a sophisticated deal over commercial real estate or uh, required jet fuel to an airliner in installments. These are just strawberries, folks, at a farmer's market. They've probably seen similar displays and signs in their trips to the farmer's market. And yet, it was still about contracts, it was still relevant, it was still about offers, and still about facts. In order for them to find an offer here or not, they would have to use the facts they're seeing to marshal and tease out the law. What's more challenging, however, is when the context of a doctrine is inherently more remote. Here's another example of blending skills with doctrine. Let's take a look at the dreaded 2207 Battle of the Forms, where, yeah, I know, where, <laughs> where the UCC does an end run on the mirror image rule in order to save contracts that would have otherwise failed under the traditional contracts doctrine. Now, I teach this a few weeks after the strawberry lesson, and I could have hidden the ball here too. 
I could have made them read 2207 on their own, uh, cover some cases to show how courts resolve issues using the provision and then move on to something else. But 2207 is a highly technical provision under the commercial code. To access it, a lawyer would need to know how to read codes and statutes. Here was number one again, where the, uh, the, the mimesis was hiding, where the presentation of that law was begging me to explore his skills of statutory reading and interpretation. This lesson was going to be as much about reading codified material as it was about battles and forms. And two, this was relevant for my students because knowing how to read densely written legal texts is something that they always need, but many of them at this point lack the experience with. And so three, we're back to the discovery. Hmm. Uh-oh. This time, we do jam. <laughs> the last time they liked strawberries, so this time they, they, I'm going to give them strawberries again, but in the form of a jam involving a large strawberry seller and a commercial jam maker. Now, the parties have agreed on what they've wanted. Uh, this deal was going to cost a lot of money on both sides. It was going to be a win-win for both of them. But here's a hitch. The pre-printed fine print clauses on the backs of the purchase order and the sales confirmation don't match. This contract would fail under the, this contract would fail under the, the traditional uh, contracts doctrine. And so, no strawberries for you. What do we do? Well, 2207 could save this. But before we figure out how it would help us, we'd have to read it first. And so that's when we read it through in class, and we go over the particular provision, and I show them exactly what it takes, what a lawyer does to break down this particular difficult provision in order to map out all the major scenarios before application. By the end of the lesson, hopefully they've walked away with some things about 2207 and also some things about reading codes, so we're, that we're no longer in such a jam more. <laughs> now, uh, what's, uh, now, you could use my technique to incorporate a larger skills purpose under the, the underpinnings of a doctrinal course. Here's an example from my products liability class. The law in products liability advanced out of a tension between trying product defects cases under torts or contracts. Now, that fit is not clean, and the law is still evolving. Hopefully, someday we'll get there. But for now, that, that unclean fit affords me mimesis to build a first day exam exercise that introduces the students to the course, but also gets them to do some big picture thinking. Here's step one. And often, law classes proceed pretty rapidly from one doctrine to the next, so that students have a hard time grasping the big picture uh, or until the very end of the course, or perhaps maybe even never. So a lesson on big picture thinking or higher level synthesis skills is relevant for them because it helps them better translate black letter into larger institutional concepts. There's step two. And so now we're back to step three, back to the discovery. These students are first, they're second years and third years, so they've taken torts and contracts. On day one, I give them a fact pattern, an hour long essay that involves a product injury that also provides with them a, a huge overwhelming sense of injustice but they haven't taken products yet, so they don't have the rules to resolve the issues in the way that the courts actually have, and I don't want them to. Instead, I want them to feel the tension that courts faced when they had to yoke torts and contracts together in order to come to a body of law that could emphasize the policies we hold important in our world of mass consumerism. So, in this way, I phrase the qual call the question very vaguely in order to emphasize big picture, higher level synthesis skills. And for the rest of the semester, we continue to revisit and build on those particular skills. We can teach better. And it is by pairing skills and doctrine that we get closer to what the law actually is. Like music, like medicine, like cooking, like writing, the law is something that is a practice. It's something that we learn by doing. And what practice requires is both skills and knowledge. This is what teaching our students could be. Thank you very much.